Oh, there we are. Hello. Hey, you. I am just so excited to have a bunch of maestros to talk to for the next hour, hour and a half. This is going to be fantastic. So why don't we go around the room and say who we all are and uh, and just a little bit about yourself. So Brigid, all about you. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Dame Brigid. Um, I am uh, in Ontier, the Kingdom of Ontier, out in Seattle, uh, and previously from the kingdoms of the Middle and the East. Uh, I uh, I run help help run the, the Lady Rapier Tournament at Penzik with Illidor, my favorite partner in, in chaos. And uh, um, other than that, uh, just happy to be here. Roxanne. I Rosa, am Maester. Sorry. It's okay. I, it took me a second to register. I am Maester Rosa Marcella, uh, li currently living in Ontier. I was Dame Brigitte's student. She helped me get elevated out here. Um, I've known her since I was 15, if that says anything. Um, I well, used to ago. live, yeah, I used to live in the Middle Kingdom, Drakenwald and Kalantir. I was a Air Force brat. Second generation, I've been in this since I was five and been fencing since I was 10. Master Emily. Hi, I'm Master Emily from Ethelmark here in central Pennsylvania. Um, I am happy to be here and see so many maestros. It's, um, yeah, it's great. I mean, I always see the list and there are so few in, in our kingdom that it is really great to get the broad perspective, so. There's hey, William B., you need to turn off your mic. Oh, I'll do it for him. There we are. You, there we go. Benevolent uh, dictatorship. Benevolent <laughs> dictatorship, correct. Hi, uh, I'm Mr. Miriam de Hawk. Nobody calls me Miriam. Everyone calls me Hawk. It's much easier for everyone. Uh, from Trimaris, Florida, mundanely. Um, I know most of the, the other ladies on here, we've kind of run across each other in various Zoom things at various wars. A couple I haven't met. And... Yeah, y'all y'all get to enjoy me with my lovely background. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely. Uh, Nicolina. Hi, yeah, I'm Nicolina. <clears throat> I'm from uh, Artemisia, formerly the Outlands, and uh, mundanely I'm in Utah. Um, I've been playing about 16, going on 17 years now, and I'm pretty sure I'm the baby mod in this group because I was elevated on March 7th. I think yeah, you have a known world baby mod at the moment. I've actually been wondering about that. <laughs> I think you're the babyest of baby mods right yeah. now. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> no. Probably was made in May, on May uh, 2nd. Avery, no. Just because you're here does not mean you get to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret Lee. <laughs> Hi, Maestro Margalit. Um, in case you're wondering about the spelling, there's no E at the end, but we can fix that later. Oh, I'll fix um, that right now. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, I'm from North Shield, uh, which used to be part of Midrealm, and I've been uh, in the SCA for probably over 20 years. I lost track somewhere. Um, and at been, least 20. <laughs> yeah, at least 20, probably closer to 25. Um, I started uh, doing rapier in the SCA when I was 34. <laughs> so I had an older start. And um, I have two grown adult children, semi-adult children anyway. <laughs> yeah, Gwyneth. And, <laughs> and uh, right now, uh, I'm... It's currently about 90 something outside and about 80 something in my house. So if you see me shedding regalia and going down to a t shirt, um, I may do that. that. That's totally fine and acceptable. Thank you. It's all good. Um, I am Master Illidor. I received my Master of Defense in the West Kingdom and I am an Althamark citizen, but currently I live in Washington, the Washington, D.C. area, so I get around a good bit. 
Um, I have been fencing for, uh, let's see, let's do some math, almost 19 years, and I have been in the SCA for 31, so I am, I am up there. So, all right, um, so for people who are not participating in the video, if you have questions, and please, and feel free to chat with each other in the chat. So just please, just go, oh, we lost Emily. I don't know what happened. Um, just put your, um, your questions into the chat, and we will be happy to discuss them, um, assuming that they are not rude and terrible. So... There we are. Yes, someone is chatting in the chat box. There we are. So I'm going to go with a couple of softballs first that we already had. And um, to, unless someone, nope, no one else has, has said anything yet. So um, the first question we have is, what is the, and I'm going to do, oh, there we is. She's coming back. Emily is on her way back here. Um, what is the most overrated aspect of fencing and what is the most underrated aspect of fencing? Anyone want to go first? The overrated oh. aspect of fencing. All right, I'll give you mine just mm -hmm. as a start. So I think the most overrated aspect of fencing is that you have to be tall to win. Now, admittedly, tall? I am tall, so I, there, <laughs> I don't really, you know, but I get beaten by guys who are much smaller than me, Yago, for a shout out. He <laughs> murders me a lot. And um, uh, the most underrated aspect of fencing, in my mind, is the thing that I think most people need to work on the most, which is learning how to faint and faint really well, right? Like getting, baiting people and getting them to move the way you want them to move, I think is the most important aspect of fencing and we spend so little time teaching that to people all right i see brigid it looks like chomping at the bit to respond so i'm gonna hit go to you i, I well i mean uh if if being tall is the most overrated thing in fencing i suppose as the uh the five footer here in this uh in this chat i'm gonna say being short is the most underrated <laughs> um but um no but seriously i uh, i think um, I think tricks are actually the most overrated thing. Like someone's like, oh, I've got a trick move or I'm going to do this, this fancy thing. Uh, no, really all you need to do is know where your measure is and keep a good line, like close your lines and have good measure. Um, and, and that beats tricks most of the time. Like, like I'll see someone who's like, I do this thing. And I'm like, I, your stutter step doesn't work here. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but, uh, but uh, you know, uh, I, I'd say that's a thing. Um, and uh, another thing I'd say is probably overrated is um, uh, when, when we start adding too many uh, crazy uh, extra deliverables uh, to, to war points and melees oh. and they get out of hand. And so we end up farming for stuffed animals or have blow up dolls on the field or things like that. And I'm like, please don't. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, and, and I, I think one of the most underrated things is um, single rapier. Yeah. And a lot of people don't have the true respect for just going single sword. As a, as a rapier and dagger Italian myself, um, obviously uh, I'm all about the rapier and dagger, but single sword, it can be beautiful, it can be elegant. And when you watch someone do it well, it's just sexy. I love it. I oh, yeah. All right, Margaret Lee, you're up. Yep. So overrated. Um, speed, actually. Most people think they need to be, um, I'll, take, I'll take the sheer strength out of it because that's a young person feeling, but speed. People somehow think they need to be fast, get in there fast, do things fast, <laughs> move fast. Um, and the answer to that is no, you don't have to suddenly like, you know, take down a whole mess of methamphetamine and be the Energizer Bunny because that will get you killed. You need to be fast when it matters, only when it matters. And it's that's the key to that piece. Uh, we talk about, I will talk about with my, uh, with my students, fast hands. Mm -hmm. It's just at the moment, at the time that you need it, go. But no more than that. Only fast at the moment, only fast at the right time. It's the meaning of tempo. Um, the most underrated probably 
is in, in the fight next to single sword, which um, I admittedly I'm like Brigitte. I uh, I'm a rapier and dagger hound. I love that to death, but single sword is probably the fundament. Um, the next is really patience and translation and getting that is technique. It's really the technical skill such that everything is technically correct. Because once it's technically correct, your lines are closed, you're executing with technical correctness at the right time, at the proper place, at the proper measure, in the proper form. The speed doesn't matter. The strength doesn't matter the correctness matters. You are technically at the right place at the right time at the right moment executing correctly. And then the rest falls away. And the technical correctness, because it requires no thought that then goes into the muscle. So technique, especially when you don't have to rely on speed or anything else, then it becomes all that is. So that's the most underrated is technical correctness. Do we want to continue with this question or do we want other ones? I have. Okay. I have. You have oh, an okay. opinion? All right, Emily. Um, the most underrated is controlling the fight. Um, we, we, we've talked about speed and, and timing and all of that comes together only if you're controlling the fight. So that's, the, that's one of the most underrated. I think that kind of goes with the, the note about faints and having really good faints is because when someone says faints and I always see that also as not just faints, but making the other person do what you want to do, yes. which sometimes it's not a faint. Sometimes it's an intentional opening that you're like, I'm going to intentionally leave this just a little open and they'll take that and we'll go on from there. Um, uh, Magalit said about you, you do, you do, yeah you do more than control just the timing you control the tempo you control what they're doing but all of that is in ten, contingent upon yeah. you actually controlling it so you have to do that first before you play <laughs> Rosa did you have did you have a comment I did kind of kind of with everything um I think the most overrated thing out there is like blade length like a lot of people really depend on the length of their sword to help them win um and then the most underrated thing is actually treating the sword like a sharp weapon over just a game mm -hmm. which would refocus your training and stuff um i've had um a couple training sessions like that where if you focus on training like it is an actual short sharp sword that you're drilling and everything and dynamic of understanding certain drills makes more sense than if you just treat it like a sporting equipment that yeah you're gonna do silly things at work because it's just how the sport and the game works so i think underrated is just how people treat the sword over um, being more participating as the game than a real weapon. All right. Um, I think last was Nicolina. Do you yeah. have a comment or do you want a new question? I'll, I'll go real fast. Okay. Um, I think the most overrated thing is natural talent. Um, I, I think it depends on your area, but in a lot of areas, there's a whole lot of focus on that guy who shows up or that girl who shows up and just straight off the bat is doing really well. But in my experience, six months later, a year later, you it's hard to pick them. And so I, and I think one of the most underrated things is just plain putting in the work. Yep. The person who shows up to every single practice eventually will smoke the person who doesn't. Uh, so there was a question on real quick for chat for some of the people. Uh, some of the questions were, if you're not a maester, is it okay for you to be here? Yes, of course. We're just the, the maesters are just going to be the ones chatting, but feel free to, to, to put a question into chat. I mean, talking, the maesters are going to be the ones talking. Everyone else is allowed to be here. Uh, um, all right, so I'm going to go back into chat really quickly and see another one. So one of the other questions we had was, how do you handle mansplaining? 
Martin Lee, you smiled first, so it's up on you. How do you handle mansplaining? <laughs> um, I don't, I, I do have to say, I don't face it too much, mainly because, um, so I, I, I have to set a certain privilege. One, because I'm old, and two, because I'm a doctor. Most people don't get the words out of their mouth too much to mansplain to me. It takes about two seconds before that shit stops. Um, occasionally, people will attempt to do so, and then I will interrupt them and say, oh, that's very interesting. Let me give you, let me tell you how that doesn't work. Let me tell you my credentials. And if they keep overriding me, I just pull rank and go. Now, they sometimes used to mansplain to me before I had rank, and then I would listen to what they had to say. And then if it was valuable, great. If they explained to me something about my body, oh, I had knowledge that I could just flood them with, you know, and it's really hard to pull rank over that. Right. And again, I have a pretty forceful personality. There's not a whole lot that steamrollers me. And then finally I could just ignore them. Oh, that's nice. Bye. And I don't need to take instruction from that. I don't need to listen to that. I can always walk away and find other places to go or be. And so I've been through, you know, 35 years and nine years of education in an MD and a PhD program. I've learned to just walk away from that, that shit, tell them to go away. Um, it doesn't, so they don't, it generally lasts about five, 10 seconds, more or less, before they realize that I know more or I don't need them. And so it doesn't, doesn't happen. Now I can tell other people how to deal with th those things. Um, it just is because they're not in a situation that I'm in. Yeah. Great. Uh, Hawk, how do you deal with mansplaining? Um, so I started in the SCA when I was about 17 and I started with fencing right away. And I will completely admit, even today, I probably look like I'm 17. And I went a long time looking, you know, like I was a cute little 16 year old. So I got quite a bit of it. Um, and I'll admit that I didn't always see it. It's kind of the same thing with how I see misogyny is that I don't tend to see some guy is treating me, she started the swearing, I get to continue on, treating me like ass because I'm a girl. I see it as he's treating me like ass because he's a douche. Um, so I tend to shove the blame the other way. Honestly, what, what Margaret Leet said was kind of how I deal with it. Sometimes, depending where it is, I'll sit there, I'll willing to listen for a minute or two. Like, maybe they have something fine to say. Nope, never mind. Smile, nod, walk away. Like Margalita kind of have a, a fairly forceful personality. I will admit that, oh, that's nice. And that bless your heart, Southern. Southern, Southern insult works perfectly fine. Um, I'm going to jump in really quick. I don't know a single maester that does not have a forceful personality. Like all of us. Yeah. There's none of us that are yeah. like, Shy and retiring. None of us. <laughs> I, I don't think it works. Um, no. I'm going to jump in for my answer on this one. Is an, and uh, a, a maester who's being quiet also agreed with me on this one, which is I just stab him in the face. That just makes my day a lot better, right? I just stab him in the face, right? Like they can talk to me as much as if they want and I'll just get bored and then stab them. And then that seems to go a lot better once that happens. That is also a, a valid, if you can, I mean, mind you, I've had instances where I stabbed them in the face over and over again and they were, they got mad about that. <laughs> and so, <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> so like, well, die mad guys, sorry. I All think right. I started fencing in 99 or 98. I think it was maybe 98. Um, and I was a cadet for a couple of years and I was a very fiery uh, person. I had, I was very quick to temper. Um, and if, uh, if someone would start a fight with me, uh, I would make sure to end it. <laughs> and uh, I remember there was at one point in time where uh, I refused to back down. So did he. It went on for a while, and then both of our warders pulled us off of Midma, which was the Yahoo group for like oh. you know, to calm down. Uh, <laughs> and um, I might remember that. I've, I've since, uh, in, in my my older years, um, uh, 
figured out a little bit better anger management uh, solutions to uh, to uh, people who, who who do that sort of thing. <laughs> and so now I, I give a very polite but forceful thanks, but no thanks. Um, and and then usually I'll just walk away. Yeah. Um, Nicolina, but but you when I was a... young and fiery, by gosh, uh, I would I would pick that fight. Yeah. Basically, a lot of times, what works best is I don't need you. You're of no <laughs> use to me. All right, Nicolina, do you have a comment? Yeah, um, so mundanely, I'm a software engineer, um, and <laughs> I get that a lot at work, and it's just become, I, I almost don't notice anymore, and I just don't cooperate. Just They, they start oh, talking. I like that. Talk, they've been talking too long. I'm going to spit it in and give my opinion, and if they don't like that, um, I probably don't notice that either. <laughs> I, I can empathize. Um, I went to a convention. I'm an industrial designer, and I went to a convention for um, my my particular software. There were 300 attendants there, and there were 10 women. 10. Yep. That's it. And I was like, all right. And so people came to me and tried to talk to me about things. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> sure. All right. Let me grab another question. Um... There's a couple in the chat if you want to pull out of there. Yeah, I'll pull out of there as well. So 8, I don't 40, I'm 42 PM is the first one. What? Do you want me to pull the uh, questions out and private message them to you so you don't have no, to scroll through I've everything? Got them. I've okay. got them. Uh, one of the ones I liked up here was, um, are there things you just had to accept as just something you have to deal with on your path to becoming a maestro at gender things or culture things? If you face or challenge things like that, what did you do? What did you recommend? What would you recommend to others? I don't know if there's anything that like, I don't, I don't like the, the, the concept of, oh, you just have to accept it. Cause as you've heard from all of us talking about me unsplaining, our response has generally been, no, I don't have to accept this. I'm going to stab you in the face or I'm going to just tell you to buzz off or some version of that. Um, there are things that you kind of like expect, like, okay, I know this is going to show up. Like, I know I'm going to run into guys that aren't going to take my blows. But I'm sure guys run into dudes who won't take their blows as well, based on, you know, my conversations with guys. It's, it's the name of the game. But it doesn't mean we have to accept it. Right. We're good. Um, I would say one of the things that I, I had to accept at first, and now I do a better job of educating um, uh, uh, people on is uh, the adrenal dump. Um, <clears throat> and I, I would do, I would go to great lengths to not be seen if I had to cry, if I got interrupted and I had too much adrenaline, the waterworks are just going to show up. Like I can't stop them. It's not because I'm sad or I'm upset. It's just, I have, I have this energy and it has to go somewhere. Um, and I, I, I've, I have many hilarious stories and so do we all about how we've dealt with that. And um, now, now actually, instead of accepting that, accepting that being a thing, I make a, a very open and frequent conversation um, about that sort of thing. And one of the things I don't tolerate anymore is being told, oh, that, that lady fighter over there, she's too emotional. She's, no, she's not. Okay. And I'm, I'm just, I have zero chill for that conversation anymore. Zero. Where is that? So, well, I just blanked on the question. What was the question? I had something right, to it. Okay. We'll, we'll go with a new, a new question for you then. Were okay. you independent before you were recognized as a master, master of defense? No. Okay. Um, Wait. I, were you, were you and, a provost? To were anyone? you a provost? Yes. That, that's what a dependent is. Oh, dependent. I heard independent. No. <laughs> I even um, have an earphone in to try to hear better, and I still didn't uh, hear. Oh, uh, Yes, I was a dependent, uh, mostly because uh, before recently I was extremely introverted. Um, I used to be under, since I'm second generation, one of the youngest scarfs in the middle ever elevated still. Um, I've always been under the shadow of my father, who's two times peer, warder, um, top 20 mod in the middle but i moved out to on tier right as the mod got created so nobody knew me 
I was this hot stick from the middle, um, was on the champions team eight years in a row for Penzik, two times champion kingdom, but nobody out here I knew, cares about that. <laughs> yeah, I came out here, nobody knew me. So I went straight to Brigitte as she got elevated because I've known her since I was a wee lad. Um, I do say I lad think I was a reason. teenager too. Yeah, but um, no, I took on a dependent because I became independent to help me with the diplomacy more than the actual skill um, because it was there and I knew she could talk and get me connected. When, when uh, Rosa was elevated, uh, my speech, because uh, Max and, and, and um, uh, Gwendolyn uh, came out for his elevation and my speech was, when I met him, he was, uh, she, she was, uh, you know, Max's kid, Martin, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I was like, and this is Max's kid, who is a, a bronze ring. And this is Max's kid, who's on the champions team. And this is Max's kid, who uh, became a kingdom champion twice. And this is Max's kid. And then he moved out here. Nobody knows who she is. Mm -hmm. And that's great. And I would like to tell you all that this is my peer, Maestro Rosa. And it was just like, suddenly, you know, Rosa's entire, you know, SCA career, you know, Max's kid, and now, you know, Maestro Rosa. So, yes. Thank you. Emily, what about you? I already know the oh, answer. God. Were you independent before you became a maester of defense? I was not. There were so many mods in my group that I didn't, I saw the crazy going on. And I'm like, no. <laughs> you were, but you were a cadet. I was a cadet before I was a white scarf. Um, once the MOD rolled around, there were um, four. In, in my per, um, in my local group. And um, I wasn't privy to everything going on mod, but I, I did see the crazy going on. So I was, I was willing to wait until they got some of the things hashed out, straightened and, and, um, and then settled down. Settled down. And, uh, and then we made you, I believe is what happened. Right yeah, after that. I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> Come join the crazy. <laughs> what about you, Nicolina? Yeah, I was a provost. I was actually a cadet to a Don in the Outlands, and I moved, and he released me, and then I became a provost to Master Lawrence Bacon. And All right. Um, I guess some of the people I may be wondering whether you need to be uh, dependent before you become a, a, a higher level. And there's that, that sense of, well, everybody seems to have been a cadet or a provost, depending on how long your math is in this thing. And so I, I suspect people are looking to see, well, did anybody become a maestra or, you know, when they became a maestra without it? Oh, oh, I can answer that. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was neither cadet. I was cadet for a hot minute, right? I was not, yeah. But I was not a cadet when I became a white scarf. And... I was obviously not a provost when I became a maester of defense since I was the first in our kingdom. So that right. was my time. And so I want to add to that. Sense All right, Marley, too. We do have, we do have a ton of questions as well. Okay. So we I'll, I'll, this one, or do I'd you like to hop one? on that real quick though. All um, right. This is your because, time around though. Just saying. I'll hop I on it for I can um, I think so, I'm going to say the same um, thing. I, I believe that no, you don't need to be a provost. No, you don't need to be a cadet. However, we cannot genuinely stand here and say that that will uh, be a, a, an easy road, right? right. And, there are, and there are crowns that insist that you should be a student, that they, you know, because they, as knights, expect people to be squires, to learn how to, how to do the thing, how to be part of a peerage. So while you may not need to be a student, your um, your path could be more difficult if you're not. Uh, you don't have an advocate, and crowns may view you as someone who 
is not humble enough or doesn't have the connections and the understanding yet. Um, oh. So the, that, that answer is a little more complicated. Oh. That, that advocate king, part of it, king, I think, is the hardest part. That's a little bit, depending on how big your circle is. I would caution right. that by saying that um, you may not need to be a dependent of somebody. You may well need to be uh, a student, meaning have a relationship with a variety of people without being a dependent of them. It's being fine. In a dependent relationship. Um, so that people know who you are, can speak for you, can talk about the relationships with you and how they teach you, but you need not be in a dependent peer relationship with them in order to get that advocacy. But you may, for your own learning and for your own ability to be known, need to have a relationship of, you need to have some sort of relationship with others in terms of your learning. I think it's you think it, anthology independent. And you would think at that point in time that, that, that the people around you would give you the guidance that you need. So you don't necessarily have to be there. Right. I have people, I have yeah. people that have had like right. four different major teachers, right. but they don't, aren't a dependent and don't want to be a dependent. <laughs> I get that. So that leads to another question that's kind of in the, in the box and I'm going to kind of riff on it a little bit. And it was along uh, the lines of how do you get mentored? Particularly, <laughs> let me finish. Uh, what, wait, did you want to say something first, Nicolina? No, no I'm just, I'm calling dibs. Okay, that's dibs, all right, good. All right, let me get the whole question out and then you can, you can go. The question is, is how do you get actually to be mentored? It seems like the person who has the most natural talent gets the mentoring and support regardless oh. of showing up for practices or practicing on their own. And I'm going to riff on this a little bit. And I tend to think that men who are seen as more naturally, uh, naturally talented than women, air quotes, air quotes around this, more naturally talented than women get more mentoring than women do. Do you feel that is correct? Not correct? Give us your riff. Nicolina, you're up first. Everyone else, before you interrupt, you have to raise your hand. Like we're, you know, we're back oh, in school. Oh, do I do that? Yes. Raise your hand if you want to talk. Go, Nicolina. All right. Um, so yes, that has been my experience. Um, the not always men, but who, whoever is showing the greatest amount of talent right out of the gate, very often in my experience, gets the most mentorship. Um, that's when you start having teachers just tripping over themselves to get the, them as a potential student. Um, that's a thing that happens. I don't like it and I speak out against it whenever I can, but it's a thing that happens. Um, in my experience, because I, I felt like I was a little bit ignored when I first started, um, and I just got in the habit, and every single person who I, t a newer fighter that I talk to, I give them this advice of, as soon as your fight with somebody is over, you go, how can I be better? And I do that pretty much every single fight still. And it, it's, I do it with newbies and it's fun to watch the deer in the headlights expression when a maester just asks them <laughs> how she can be better. But when you're over and over and over again, asking the, the, um, the mods and the white scarves that you just challenged to a fight, how can I be better? Usually they will give you advice if they're, if they're worth their scarf. And um, then afterwards talking to them, and asking about if you're interested in a formal student teacher relationship, figure out who you would like to study with and talk to them about it. Take the initiative. And that's when the forceful personality comes in handy. Anyone else hand raising? They want to talk about this one? Hawk. So um, I got, I've, I've said it a million times. I got lucky beyond all belief when I showed up at my first fight of practice. I can look back at who was there and who I happen to get attached to and be like, yeah, I got lucky because he's one of the best teachers in our kingdom. And I'll give myself a small bit of credit because I got to kind of be his guinea pig, you know, 20 odd years ago of him being like, okay, I teach like this. I'm like, no, no, forget the numbers. It's not going to work. Um, but the biggest thing is, is kind of what she said is being willing to ask. Like we've kind of talked about how most of us ministers, we tend to have pretty forceful personalities. And part of that is that willingness of whoever you're fighting. If you see someone on the side of the field and you're like, he fight pretty, he fights like I do. I want to go, I want to go learn that. 
walking up and asking. Like that's it's. I'm not shy. I don't have a problem with it. I know other people do, but that willingness to ask. Anyone else, or I'll take this one. Oh, okay, just real quick. Sorry, too slow. <laughs> um, so the I think the underlying theme we have here, and you're seeing it, and and this is for uh, our non-male participants that are listening in, is that. Um, you have a hard road. Like we have all gone down this very hard road ourselves, right? It's like it, all of us have had challenges in our own way. Um, it is not easy what we're doing. You are bucking against the normal mode or the normal expectations of what they expect a rapier fighter to be. And so your road is harder than, you are on hard mode on this. And on that note, I'm also going to add this. You have to build it right? Because you're on hard mode, you have to basically build it. And so we're basically telling you, you can't wait to be mentored. You're going to have to learn how to mentor yourself. And that includes going to people who you think are good and talking to them, reaching out to the community and going and taking classes and training, basically having to almost train yourself in some ways. And the good news now is, is that because we're all stuck in our houses right now, there's all kinds of videos out there for you to train. <laughs> like Remy right now. Remy's one of my favorites. He does it every week, twice a week right now. Um, uh, we've got... Um, uh, Arnez is doing twice a week um, uh, training. Uh, we've got uh, Aaron Harper is doing classes. We have we have cl we have classes happening all week long, every day. You absolutely yep. should be listening and, and training with that on this one. All right, who is going to counteract me? Emily, did you have something? Wait, I'm going to counteract you. Too. You did. You go. Um, so um, my experience is going to be different because when I started. And you know, of course it's different now for folks, but when I started, there were seven of us and we were all equally, equally ignorant. So it wasn't like you could be mentored. It was the, you know, the best, the person who could mentor you or teach you, there wasn't a teacher. Mm -hmm. It was the one-eyed man who had a little more knowledge teaching the rest of us blind folk what we could do next week. And when we went to period rapier, it's like, okay, I may have heard this from so-and-so who might have gone to a, a, a WMA conference. Let's bring back this knowledge. Okay, here's the book. Nope, wait, we were wrong. So it was a case of truly the blind leading the blind. And was there a gender difference? Maybe, but there were only a couple of us. And so it, the expectations, it was whoever had as long as you were willing to work and show up, there were so few of us, it was hard to say that there was much in the way of a gender difference at the very beginning. It's a little harder in a sense now because now there's a hierarchy. It's not like we, you know, you could have, you have people who are seen as teachers, peers, harder to approach. There's an expectation that there's a teacher and a mentor and you have to approach these difficult people and there's an expectation that there's actually, uh, you're not, you can learn from somebody else. We're not all learning to get piecing it together by the, by the hook or crook, which makes it a little more difficult actually. There are no, for, except for, and, and Illidor talked about all these teachers, but in a sense, most of the places, most of the time, um, there isn't most, quote, teachers don't have any more training to teach, even if they're reasonably good fighters, than anybody else. They're not instructors. They don't know from teaching. They may fight fairly well, but they're not paid to teach. They aren't taught to teach, and they don't know how to teach. Great. So I'm going to go to Brigid. Give your hand um, up. So there's a, there's a follow-up uh, question related to this question that I wanted to answer. Um, and that question uh, was uh, in regards to the extroverted people not being afraid to ask for help. How would you advise someone who is shy and afraid to approach for teaching and instruction? There is a young woman up here who is very, very shy and unlikely to approach anyone for teaching instruction. Um, I wanted to reply to that. Uh, and uh, as someone who adopts introverts, that's like my thing. Like I, I, find, I find introverts and I adopt them. Um, 
But one of the other things I recommend is if you see someone who, who you know, could use a little help, you know, find a way to give an introduction to them in a way that's not scary. You know, uh, maybe off to the side, you know, as, as the day is winding down and people are kind of leaving for court, you know, maybe get an introduction in or say, hey, I just fought this person, you know, and, and try and, and initiate and help those conversations. And if they're uncomfortable, you know, that maybe they don't want it, maybe they don't want the help, but um, it's, it's up to us also to kind of look to people and see, hey, is there someone that's really shy? Is there someone who's shy and struggling and I could help? And one of the things that I always make a point of doing is like finding fencers who I don't know, um, especially newer fencers and spending time with them. And then afterwards, I always make a point of saying, hey, uh, would you like me to give you my opinion or my feedback? Uh, and then, and then I, I, in that way, make that connection um, on, on my own uh, proactively. Um, and so if you see someone who's shy and maybe wants a little help, you know, we, we can, we are kind of, uh, you know, loud uh, women many times, but we can also be very um, sensitive to people who, who need that, that additional help quietly on the sidelines. Talk. Two bits. Uh, one is kind of, as Brigitte said, if you, if you are in any way, shape or form, this, this, um, this girl's mentor, friend, teacher, whatever you call it, like I consider it my duty as, you know, my, my cadet, my job is to be like, she would learn cool things off of Illidor. Yo, Illidor, this is my cadet, teach her things. But the second is kind of a funny one. And I know people may laugh at this. If anyone's ever seen Master Wistrick's fight me sign, Yes. Um, I know it seems like the funniest thing on earth. It's literally, it's a little wooden sign that says, fight me on it. And you stand on the side of the field and you hold it up and people fight you. Um, and it seems like such a silly thing, but if you're afraid to ask people to fight you and then have that opportunity to be like, okay, what can I work on? Make her a fight me sign. Like, it seems silly, but it really works. And it means you don't have to step out. You're inviting people to come to you. So those are my two solutions on that. Fight me signs is a bomb. <laughs> uh, absolutely, the fight me sign. Uh, Nicolina. Um, Rose okay. really had her hand up for a while. All right, Rosa, for you then. Well, um, I would have some people have had some specific questions for you, so I was gonna like hit you up for those. So, but I, I yeah, I did have a follow up. So many, many Pensix, we noticed this particular problem way back in the early two thousands. Um, before I turned 18 or right around when I turned 18, 19, we noticed this problem of people sitting at the sidelines when there's hundreds of new people to fight and you have those people that just don't know how to ask. So my dad and I created a tourney called the early bird tourney. Only requirement is the first tourney of Penzik war and it's in the morning. And what we did was we set it up as a forcing people to talk and talk to each other. And we would help people talk to each other. We kind of stayed at the sidelines, saw who were the shyer people. And I'm an introvert to a point. I can be extroverted when I need to be, when I know more people. If I'm in a position of leadership, I can be extroverted. But when we notice those people that are shyer, we create a environment that forces them to kind of get to know each other so the early bird tournament is um you have to ask a question and the person with the most interesting facts even if you only ask one question and get your one fact great but you're fighting someone now so we've kind of created an environment to have those things at bear pits i make sure i pick the quiet ones I try to walk up to them and then I just start rambling and talking. I'm great at pickup conversations with people on the sidelines at bear pits that get picked last or something. So that way I can get the talking going and be like, have fun, have a blast. And it usually works, but then they go back to their corner, but you just try. You're getting a lot of compliments in chat, by the way. A lot of people <laughs> yeah. saying they really like uh, they really like the early bird turning. Okay, I have an anonymous question uh, that I was given earlier in the day, and once you hear it, you'll probably know why. It's it's long, so you all wait until I am done. Right? Feel free <laughs> to raise your hand, and I'll go around the room. 
or around the Zoom. And yeah, I know you have to <laughs> You are you get to go a little later because you've been talking a little bit much. Emily, you're gonna get called out, by the way. Just telling you right now. In the last year, there has been an extensive discussion about including non-male fighters in the rapier community, ensuring that they're getting training, attention, awards, and recognition that male fighters have received. I have heard the same discussions repeated over and over with no actionable decisions on being brought forward. What proactive and actionable steps can we do to help the non-male fighters of our community? Before you pop, there's more to this. The next one is we did get an, uh, uh, another comment that this one was on uh, the virtual, uh, virtual uh, Academy of the Rapier event. And it was along the lines of, and I highly recommend people to go take a look at it. It's involving the actual numbers. We've had people who have done the actual math and it's um, on how you were, we have a leaky pipe syndrome when it comes to women. And it starts off with about 30% of all, or at least for the, the kingdoms that were surveyed, 30% of the AOA level rapier awards go to women. Then it starts to go down to like, when it get to the grant level, about 25%. And for the seven kingdoms that they reviewed, it was something like 11%. But for the rest of the known world, I know it's about 13%. And they did a regression, they did a regression um, analysis, and it shows up to about, it looks to be about 43% of all participants when they start are female. And I will say from my own eyeballing it for the past 19 years, that looks to be about right. That it starts off about 40% women, 60% male at, at the very beginning levels, and then it starts to drop off in participation in awards over time. So again, the question is, what proactive and actionable steps can we do to help the non-male fighters in our community? And, oh, we've got, Perrin has posted the blog in there. So, we're gonna talk a good bit about this before, and Emily has been quiet, so I'm putting you on the spot, Em. Let's go, <laughs> what are your actionable things we can do? Mm, it, it, this is something that uh, is very important to me. Uh, I, I see a lot of females that come into fencing and one of the biggest things that they lack is confidence. Um, when I first started, I was, I was very shy. I was very quiet. I know it's hard to believe. I was very shy and very quiet. And I was very, very fortunate where I grew up that it didn't matter that I was a girl and it didn't matter that I was female and it didn't matter that I was new. They trained me just as they would have trained anyone else. But I do see females that come in without that confidence that don't want to ask, that don't want to, to ask you to train them or help them or give them advice. And I do make it a point now being where that I, where I am to seek them out and talk to them see what they're thinking, um, if they have any goals, what their plans are, and help them, kind of just kind of take them under your wing or point them to somebody who can that's closer to them, possibly. All right, who else? Raise right. oh. your hand. Marguerite. So part of this is adding a little nuance because we can't understand, we don't understand why people are dropping out. And there's a lot of reasons. And we have to look at the difference between getting awards as well as time in. Okay, so are they dropping out of fighting? Are they dropping out of awards? So I have yeah. a quick, have you looked at the, have you looked at the paper? Yes. Okay. And it doesn't so tell us that they're dropping. I've looked at it. It only talks okay. about awards. Okay. No, it does talk about, yeah, but it also talks about time to get awards as well. Yes, but it doesn't tell us if they've stopped fighting. Oh, People that's fair. Stop fighting. It doesn't tell us how many, and also time to awards is a different process than skill, if you remember. Awards depend on a lot of different things. Okay. So there's a award given. It's whether you skill and competence in your skill, and then uh, drop out of fighting altogether. Okay. So we have to nuance that and understand what goes into the fighting cycle of women. And I'm going to put cisgendered women in a slightly different category than 
non-binary, non-male fighters, because there's also, they may have different issues as well. So we have to kind of understand what's involved in that. One of the things, so in order to get actionable items, we have to figure out what, whether there's systemic issues, there's award granting issues to deal with the award problem, and then supporting people in their fighting skills, regardless of the award problem. So we have an award problem, we have a fighting problem and a retention problem, and right. then we have the larger systemic problem. So to answer the question though, Marguerite, what are your actionable items that we can do? So actionable items we can do are attack on three things. One, for the award, for the um, systemic problems, on individual people, so I, you know, we have a systemic piece, on individual people, because I, I, we have systems and individual people. For individual people, we have to figure out, help them figure out what their goals are, okay? What they want and what their barriers are. So we have barriers are medical, childcare, uh, support, spouse or partner that's not supportive, okay? Those are transportation. Those are issues that women uh, and some non-male fighters face more often than their male counterparts particularly childcare or time out to have children. That's a delay. We see it on the tenure track all the time. And that buys them longer times just in fighting. Another issue is again, the issue of training and confidence to training and building resilience to ask, to know how to ask those questions. People who've had goals or have had a chance to get ideas in sport all the time, like most men, have just been expected to know sport and what their goals are. Yeah, I want to get good and I want to get the thingy. Many women and non-male fighters haven't been challenged to think about those things or how they want to get to them or that there are even goals for them. So teaching them how to ask those questions and set those goals and what they can do or what they're, what they're able to do to meet those goals and set timelines. Those, that kind of resilience and building goals for themselves and then helping them achieve those goals are important in fighters' paths, and then helping to match them up with teachers if they can. There's a, sometimes th that's really a difficult option, because again, teacher shortage and good teacher shortage. And so how can we match that up is another actionable item. And helping people develop realistic expectations, which is true for me and true for many of us. Realistic expectations is the path is fucking longer. It, is. it just is. All right, so I'm gonna pause you there for a second. Um, uh, Duchess Dorinda, who's also a Maester of Defense, wanted to make a comment, but she does not want to be on video. So she asked me if she could comment now. And the answer is yes. Go Dorinda, all you. The actionable item that I think that we need to do is make sure that people get time and encouragement to fence. There are a million different ways to get good at fencing, but I don't know any of them that involve not doing a lot of fencing. And I see so many women fencers that take more than their fair share of turns of marshalling, MOLing, water bearing, doing the sideboard, I got to sit troll today. It's like, no, what you need to do is absolutely you need to help. Make sure you build a fencing community, but you build a fencing community so that you too get defense and other women get defense. And we also need to Get, help people get over that emotional thing. Well, I'm probably not going to be very good today. I don't feel very good today. It's like, doesn't matter. You go fence. Anybody can be good on a good day. When you get good is when you're good on a crappy day. When you're tired and you're still good. When you're sad and you're still good. When you're stressed and you're still good. And we need to remind women to get out there and fence. And I will take your turn, Marshallin. You go fence. Somebody else can sit at troll today. It's your turn to go fence. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Your Grace. Yes. All right. Does anyone, uh, Brigid, do you want to follow up? I Where's think Nicolina was next. What? I think Nicolina is next, but I want in on this. All right, Nicolina, you're next. Uh, first of all, uh, that is spot on about what I was about to talk about. 
and uh, she expressed it better than I could. One thing I just wanted to add on is that mm. in there's been study after study in corporate environments that women have a tendency to volunteer for the job that nobody wants to do, especially if it's people don't want it because it knows that it won't uh, for their their career. And I see that all the time in the SCA, even if they want to be out there fighting, they're like, oh, you know, somebody has to marshal. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I see a huge percentage of women marshalling all the time. And I um, both as the person who might get stuck marshalling or as someone in a leadership position that is noticing that, okay, she's she hasn't fought today, you go, okay, let's see, who has not marshaled today? Grab them by the collar and go, hey, you're gonna marshal. Oh, you don't have your marshal authorization? Well, you're gonna stand right next to me and learn how. All right, bring it. Okay, um, I, I wanted to, to touch on a few points and then say something. Um, <clears throat> so absolutely what Dorinda said was true. And when we went to, uh, we were at Penzik uh, and had one of the first Maester of Defense meetings uh, before the main uh, Master of Defense meeting at Penzik. And uh, I believe it was Natalia who brought this up originally, which was, <clears throat> we need to stop encouraging women fighters to hit the service track hard. We need to make them do the prowess track, U prowess town USA track hard. Yeah. And one of the problems is, is that, th and, this, and this is what happens. Um, <clears throat> All of the fighters who are who are the newbie like fighters get to a point of good. They get good enough to hit that mid level, and we're like, great, you're at that mid level now. You need to start serving your kingdom. You should be a marshal. You should do things outside of the the fencing community to uh, make yourself more rounded, be a better courtier. And what what guys here typically, and this is this is very stereotypical is they're like, okay, cool, when I have time after fighting, maybe I'll do a retinue shift. Or if I have time, maybe I'll do a little bit of marshalling, but I'm here to fight, fight, fight. What women tend to hear is, oh, there's a thing. I must now complete this next thing. And so we end up with a lot of women who get really good to this plateau, and then they sideline just right off that ramp into Service Town USA, and they become you know, great service junkies, great arts junkies, and we never get them back on the field and they don't close out the field like the guys do. Like, right? <clears throat> one of the, and, and so that's one of the things that we need to really be careful of when we see that. Um, when, I, when I give this as an example to people, um, in the real world, um, let's say there's a job posting that you want for a promotion and it says you need five years experience. And a woman will be like, oh gosh, I have four years experience. I really hope it's there when I, when I qualify because I'm not qualified right now for that job, and and I really should should you know be prepared for that job posting. And the guy's like, well, I have I have two years experience. I definitely am not qualified, but I'll get interview experience and and networking by by getting into this interview. And then he's the only one who interviews and he gets the job. And then everyone's like, well, why why did he get promoted over her? It, we we need to take more space for ourselves. You know, in, 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 in the rapier community, we need to take up more space for ourselves and we need to take up more space for other women as well. Um, on, on Marguerite's point about womening, uh, 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 womening, uh, mothering, uh, motherhood. Uh, I'm not a mother, I'm a cat person. I have like avoided being a mom because I'm terrified of sidelining my career. Um, <clears throat> and so one of the things that, that at the, Penzik um, uh, uh, lady, women in rapier panel that Lilius ran. Uh, Eva, Mistress Eva from the East brought up, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a woman and, and I'm also a mother. And this is a problem that people are not giving us time. And one of the things she said that really stuck with me is that SCA time hurts moms. If you have arranged for your childcare your, your child care situation, you, you've paid someone to, to babysit for two hours or your, uh, you know, husband or, or partner is coming back and you're swapping, you know, over. If something runs on SCA time, you have to leave that tournament. Like, you don't have the ability to just be like, it's okay that everything runs late. It actually hurts women when everything doesn't run on time because typically we're the ones that arrange for the food, we arrange for the childcare, we arrange for caring for our partners. 
We arrange for a great deal of stuff that's just taken for granted. And so SCA time is really a problem and it's something that's just systemic and we take for granted. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things um, that uh, I, I wanted to say on the topic of retention of women and keeping women in before I go to the uh, women uh, elevation part uh, is uh, Natalia brought up a really great point at the Pensic Rapier uh, women uh, discussion too, which was a lot of people just don't have gear that fits women. Like a low hanging fruit, a lot of women are small and you could get small loner gear and then someone's going to stick with it if they feel like they're not fighting their armor. And yeah, you eventually do need to get your own armor, but like as a newbie, like you rely on the stuff that your baronial loner gear has. And if you don't have a small mask, if you don't have like small tunics, like a lot of us are small, right? Um, and so uh, trying to talk fast here so I don't take up too much time. Um, uh, changing uh, lanes into the uh, SCA women and why we don't have enough women in the high level awards. And I'm going to drop a truth bomb here. And I'm sick of being told that women are too emotional. Women need to know when they're ready. Uh, if, if I hear one more time, oh, she, she wants to feel like she's ready first. No, no. Because that goes back to the, the whole problem of do you, do you need to apply to this five-year promotion if, if you've only had four years? No. Like, we are not an easy bake oven. We do not, like, we are not, ding, you're done as soon as you get the award. Like, none of us are done, okay? So waiting for someone to feel like they absolutely positively have to deserve it first is, like, just not fair. Because women, we, we tend to think, we have to be ready. We have to be qualified. We've been told that we must, we must be better. We must be stronger. We must always meet all these expectations. That doesn't mean that we need to wait forever while all of our male friends are getting elevated in front of, of everyone else. And that's not fair. And so I wanted to end this on, on a thing. Um, I, I brought this up and I posted it recently on Facebook uh, because it's something that uh, when I was a little girl, my, my doctor had hanging on her wall in her office, and uh, it stuck with me all of my life. It is, a man is commanding, a woman is demanding. A man is forceful, a woman is pushy. He is assertive, she is aggressive. He strategizes, she manipulates. He shows leadership, she is controlling. He is committed, she is obsessed. He is persevering, she is relentless. He sticks to his guns. She's stubborn. A man is uncompromising. A woman's a ball breaker. A man is a perfectionist. A woman's a pain in the ass. And that right there is the crux of the systemic problem that we are facing when we are trying to get women elevated and recognized is people are like, they don't, they aren't ready either because they're, they're emotional or they, they aren't, you know, don't have enough uh, you know, uh, leadership because they're just controlling or they're just not committed enough because they're, you know, not able to stay through the tourney that ran late. You know, no, no. We need to start being realistic and remembering that these are fellow humans that are, um, have achieved a really great level of, I'm going to end my rant. I think I've said what I need to say. Okay, I feel like we've kind of covered this one a good deal, unless there's anyone who's like, I really have something else I want to talk about on this one. I feel like Brigitte has covered, um, by the way, the, you're getting a lot of what what's in the chat at the moment, Brigitte. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing that I'll add to that is, um, so I always say that like the number one way that I always recognize a great practice is, do they go out to eat together? Like that's my, my litmus test that makes it really easy to find good practices when I travel. Like the, tr the practices that go out and eat together afterwards tend to be the better practices. Just, it's a community. Um, some of those practices go out to Hooters afterwards. And mm. look, I have brothers, like, but it's very slightly uncomfortable to be in a room where, you know, all the girls are wearing booty shorts and, you know, all the guys are sitting there drooling over them. Think about stuff like that. Like, like, think about, like, the locker room talk as you go out afterwards. Think about, you know, if your mother was sitting next to you, would she feel comfortable sitting there? And if the answer is no, fix yourself. Like, make the entire environment welcoming for women. I'm with you on that. 
Um, so I've got one for uh, Maestro Rosa, if you are okay with answering this one. And that is, what can cis women do to help make trans women fencers feel more welcome? So what I've come to realize with the environment is not a lot of us want to be recognized as trans women, but are trying to hide the fact that we were men at one point. Um, when I've actually joined a couple of groups to kind of get an idea of what the SCA trans society is like, um, there's a lot of them I didn't even know, and they want to keep it that way. Fine. So, so I'm very open about it because I kind of want to give the experience for everyone of what the hell is going to happen to my body. Um, because there's going to be new things I'm going to learn that I might learn the adrenal dump and the crying and all the emotional stuff that I have yet to experience. And then COVID happened. So being on actually starting hormones and being four months in, I haven't experienced because of COVID, I haven't experienced the harassment yet. Uh, my work is very forgiving and also, but don't, the best thing you can do is don't point out that they're trans. They really don't want to be, no, they don't want, they're, they think they're that gender. So treat them like they're a cis woman. Um, because if you treat them like, oh, you used to be a man, their depression, which I have different depression anxieties, my gender dysphoria is actually mild compared to my other mental issues I have. So, but if you point out that they used to be a man, their depression could spiral and that could ruin their game, that could ruin being part of the SCA. They want to be that gender, men or women, so bad because of their dysphoria that treat them like a cis woman. That is what I'm getting from the support groups that I am in. And this is why I'm also very open on my blog. Um, you can find, if you have even any more questions, I can post it later that I have a blog that I'm very open about things to try to get people to understand the transition since I'm doing it kind of with everybody. But yes, my best, best advice is treat them like a cisgender because that's what they want to be. Right. So, um, uh, we keep losing Emily. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I just say real quick, um, for the Lady Rapier Penzik uh, tournament, uh, we support all women. And please do come and, and participate with us. And, and we want you there. We want you to be supported. Our, our rule is if you or your persona self-identifies as a woman or non-binary, you are most welcome at our tournament. Most welcome. Always, so one always, of the thing always. I did want to um, add really quickly, or I wanted to talk about very quickly, was one of the comments in there was crying. How do we feel about crying? I got lucky. Like, I, I don't know if it's because I grew up with brothers who, I'll be completely honest, like crying got you hit. And if you, you grow up with that as a very small child, like, I guess you just get over it. I don't know. I got lucky on that. But I remember the first time that one of my female friends, I saw her crying and I was literally like, oh crap, I've read about this. What do I do? Do I get you chocolate? Do I do you, what do you want me to do? Like, that was literally my response was, I don't know how to handle this. What would you like me to do? And the answer that I tend to get is leave them alone. So somebody who actually has this, like that tends to be the number one answer I get is leave them alone. Or the other one I sometimes get is distract them. Like like tell them a story or go pretend that you guys are having a very serious conversation over in the corner to give them a way to get away from people. Like somebody else who actually has the problem should probably talk about it. Hey, Lena. Yeah, so over the years, and this makes me angry to no end, I've heard multiple people be like, like, do you see that lady crying over there? Like she's throwing such a fit. That's not pure like at all. And like, makes me want to rage cry <laughs> and because uh, so many people don't realize that uh, and this isn't necessarily li limited to women but uh, it's definitely more common is that it is an adrenaline dump 
It's the equivalent to like most men on the fighting field have experienced when they're going along, they're great on adrenaline and all of a sudden they get a kind of hard shot and all of a sudden it goes to this ball of anger inside of them. And usually and the correct response at that time is go, you know what, I'm getting a little hot. I'm going to remove myself from the field. And that's, that's fine. That's completely, that's how, that's how you do it. And for a lot of women, instead of the ball of anger, it's boom. And so we shouldn't be giving women flack for suddenly the tears start and they go, okay, I'm a little hot. I'm going to remove myself from the field just because it was more obvious. I'm going next. You guys put your hands down. I see you, but I'm going. <laughs> go so um, I'm real honest about the fact that I've had therapy a couple of times in my life, right? And some, one of the things my therapist told me straight up was is that crying is good for you and it helps get like if you're if you are not letting your emotions release for some reason or another that leads to bad things like heart attacks and ulcers and other things that you know aren't really good for you and crying is literally just like tears coming out of your eyes water big deal why does it matter so honestly anyone who tell and to be honest, right, before I had therapy, they would tell me this too, right? Like, Elidor is emotional because she's crying over there. Um, I have some very angry and perhaps inappropriate words for those people. And I still to this day, anyone who ever tells you that uh, you're too emotional or you're, you shouldn't be crying or whatever, you send them to me. I'm dead serious. You send them straight to Illidor. You tell them, Illidor said crying is okay. And I will tell anyone who tells you otherwise to go pound salt. In no uncertain terms. <laughs> no uncertain terms. None whatsoever. All right. So I believe we had, Marguerite had her hand up first. So, Rose, uh, I got you. I think I don't, okay. and I got distracted because I'm old and brain damaged. But someone noticed, I think it was, um, Nicolina or Emily mentioned that just as uh, many men will get revved up and have get hit hard or have a, uh, something will happen, doesn't matter what, will get off and have a ball of anger and walk off the field. And if they're good or they have kind of control of what's going on, they'll excuse themselves and go do their thing a little far, a little way off. If they are less control, they will go and throw their mask and stamp their feet and shout or pull expletives or whatever it is. The difference between, and for many women or non-male people, they will cry. That's a com these are common responses, not universal, but common. The difference is we tend to excuse the guy who swears and throws his mask. Why is that? Why do we do that? I mean. Because I mean, it, I added it to the emotional points. Because anger makes, is, makes us less uncomfortable. Okay? It's, it's normal in a sporting event to, like, be, oh, it's a sporting event. Wait, it's, wait, 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 wait. Is it normal? It is considered n not normal like abnormal or normal. Not abnormal. It is considered standard. Right, because okay. it's a what? M typical male response? Right? Of course, it's a mask. It's okay typical. that they throw their mask and have a fit, uh -huh. but if I go have some tears, it's bad. Uh, hang on, Elidor. Okay, I'm gonna finish. Now, we have, and we've often said we should be, and I've often seen it, is saying, okay, you're having a, to the, to the masculine person saying, no, it's not acceptable that you throw your mask and have a fit. Go off, the, go off to the sideline and have your fit. Because I've seen that happen, okay? Marshals, people saying, no. You know, a few curse words, scuffing your foot, okay. But ideally, and I've seen it done, is that's enough behavior out of you. Take it off, okay? And we see it on sporting events too. After it rises to a certain point and probably longer than it should, people are expected to take it off. Now, I have the same attitude toward toward tears to some extent, okay? Just as I would expect a guy not to throw his mask and throw a tantrum when he's walking off the field, and I expect him to take it down, down the road a bit and cool his jets, I expect that someone who is having, uh, walks off the field and is having 
a total waterworks to take it off at some point. The reason being, and I learned this because I did it. I did it a lot. And, and what I learned is not that, not that I was just making people uncomfortable. That wasn't the point, the reason that anybody should tell me I'm being too emotional. The answer that I got from my colleagues, from my peers with a little p, was not that I was, my tears were making people uncomfortable. They kept second guessing their blows on me. Did I hit you too hard? Do we need to talk about that fight? Are you hurt? Okay. So and it called, and it called the fight into question. So I, I gotta, I've gotta, I'm like, I'm sorry, Marguerite, you and I are gonna have like a disagreement on this one. So because their feelings are hurt, because you had some tears, you have to moderate your own emotions and your own behavior because their feelings are hurt. It's not because when... their, their feelings are hurt because they're questioning their, the outcome of the bout. And it's, it's not, not just them, it's other people, other people who see that. They're like, oh, did he hit her way too hard because she's over there crying. Right. So it's, it's no, the, whether, whether, so it's not a matter of whether I'm being too emotional. It's, so my, my emotionality, is there any better, is my being uncontrolled or my, you know, my like, is my drama any better or worse than the guy throwing his mask drama? He's not hitting anybody. He's not. So that's the question. If my drama is holding up the fight, is holding up the thing, because five people have to ask me, was I hit too hard? Then that's I'm going to go to Nicolina, and then I'm going to go to Brigitte, and then I'm going to go to Rosa, and then I'll go to Emily. Um, I would say it gets very different because throwing your mask is a very voluntary action and tears are not. And as far as uh, people worrying because I'm on the field in tears, we need to normalize that shit and they need to be, uh, they need to be educated and get used to it and realize that it's, it's okay rather than always uh, going, oh, did she, is she hurt? Something like that. It, no, it's. Crying is in, as normal as in a athletic environment for women as sweating. Very good. Uh, so I think I see the point Margaret's trying to make, and I also absolutely agree with Nicolina. Um, when there's when there's just crying, it's just crying. If it's just if I'm just dumping adrenaline, but I'm still in control, like I you know I I'm I should stay on the field if I want to, right? However, if I'm crying in such a manner that I cannot currently control myself on the field. Like we fight with a controlled calibration. We fight with, you know, in, in, in a way, in a sport where people get concussions and people hurt themselves. And what I would hate to see is if someone was not currently in control of their emotions, not that that's not crying, right? Mm -hmm. Not in control of their emotions, be whatever it is, and then go hurt someone that would be a problem, right? However, if it's just tears, but I'm still able to talk to you like a normal person, which happens, I, the tears come and I can just talk to you like, hey, that's, that's normal, pass the water, right? You know, absolutely don't tell me to walk it off or I'll tell you like, you know, my opinions. Um, but at the same time, if, if I don't look like I am in control of my myself if it's like a serious sobbing situation mm -hmm. yeah maybe maybe i should walk off to the side calm down a little bit and then come back doesn't matter if i'm still crying or not mm -hmm. but but it are, we do fight a sport that is based on control and there are potentials for injury and that's that's the distinction i'm, I'm wait no 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 you had your time sorry no no i'm Rosa, just on you i'm just, I'm yeah. just agreeing Can with you we, we, we understand it there, this is a very interesting topic brigid keep going Okay. Um, one of the other things, um, there's people who are like, make a joke, distract them or whatever else. Um, I'm a very small person, like I'm a miniature person. Um, and the, the, the worst thing I ever want to hear is, oh, Brigitte's crying. Brigitte, are you okay? I'm not fucking five, right? I'm just crying, like, right? And I'm not a child. And instantly a lot of people, because I'm small, are like, oh, no, that, that gets my rage instantly. Like, 
not not cool at all. Like not only is it like I'm am I having an adrenaline thing, I'm also feeling very vulnerable now because I'm a small person, right? Um, one of the one of the best things that ever happened to me is one of my friends. Uh, this is an ally story. Uh, at Penzig, I got very injured, and I didn't realize I was very injured because the adrenaline was so high. And when I when the adrenaline dropped, I realized I had been clotheslined by my gorget, and my throat was rapidly swelling. Um, and uh, and I'd had an, a friend who was an, who, who was really you know in tune with how I am, who got me off the field because uh, I kept saying I'm fine, and he's like, Yeah, okay, you're not. Um, and I'm a marshal, so sit down. Um, however, um, as as I was as I was over in, in in the sidelines, he came over and just sat with me. And when people came up and they were like, Oh, hey, Brig, and he's like, Nope, she's fine. Keep moving. He didn't have to sit there. He didn't have to distract me. You don't have to come up with a reason to distract me. You can just sit next to me quietly and just play interference. And that's the best thing that I've had people help me, help me with. All right, Rosa. So I want to bring up societal toxic masculinity in with the crying. Um, in my early years of fighting, I actually suppressed a lot of my crying at Penzik War, especially because I didn't know the people because I was a man. I wasn't supposed to be emotional. And I got emotional on fields probably just as much as anybody does, but my parents never taught us not to hide our emotions. We cried at movies and everything. We, I've, I've been effeminate most of my life and it's been pointed out to me. I should have saw the clues since fifth grade, I guess. But when it comes to the crying also for men aspect is, and I'm sure it affects women also, is the toxic masculinity that we have in the society that you just period can't be emotional when you're doing certain things. For men, not supposed to be emotional at all, unless it's like your birth of your child or whatever. And talking to my therapist now, going through gender dysphoria and learning um, more about how my emotions are gonna be really wild now, that she's reteaching me to cry and that it's okay again. Um, I'm trying to actually get away from that toxic masculinity because, and I'm trying not to think, oh, now I'm going to be a woman and it's okay to cry type of thing. It's just more, I'm able to be myself now to be that emotional, to the let, let my emotions do what I need to do. That's natural. And my counselor therapist right now is talking to me about it because there's just random times I'm sitting down, especially with how the world is going and I'm losing friends left and right, emotions happen. <laughs> Emotion, emotions do happen. Emily, you had a comment. Did I? <laughs> you, you raised your hand. I did. That was a great. Right, right. Let's I mean, I'll, I'll, wait, let me just let it, right. I, I get the emotion thing. Um, I've been very lucky that I, I haven't cried in years. I think one of the biggest things that people really need to do is learn whether they're female or male is not control their emotions but learn how to deal with them and if it's crying on the field then it's crying on the field that's all okay so we're going to move on to a much easier question uh <laughs> melee or tourney which do you prefer melee depends on the tourney and the tourney we're good oh thank you uh you know, as, as a former mid-realmer in East Kingdom, I used to love melee, trained lots of people, was general for several wars. Uh, now I hate melee. I hate it so much. <laughs> and it's it's really weird for that to be a thing. Um, but I, I really just like tournaments now. And probably it's because I'm so far away from the war culture that I grew up with that it's just a thing. But I go to Penzik and I might marshal, but I just go and do attorneys now. Um, I think the melees have gotten so weird uh, that, you know, it's, it's just, we keep trying to find ways to reinvent the story, no and we don't need to. Like, we really don't. I'm really I, I can fight melees now, is so I can play what? with my friends at Penzik. I go out with my friends, I'll fight with my friends. 
Emily, you have an additional comment. And since you haven't talked too much, I'm going to give you more time. What were you, what were, why are you giggling? Well, just, just, just being on the command staff for, for fencing, just knowing why they want the um, intricate and strange tournaments or, or melee scenarios. Um, I, I'm all for the just go and go and kill people, but th there is there are reasons behind why everything gets a little bit more elaborate. That's all I'm gonna say. D and D town battle. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Mr. We Rosa, I D and D town battle. Mr. Rosa, I happen to be the armic for Gulf Wars, uh, along with Master Wistrick at the moment. We'll see who actually ends up with it. If you'd like to talk to us about ideas, I allow many <laughs> bad ideas to happen. <laughs> that said, I still do teach Melee, and I love talking about teaching Melee. Still available for it, if you ever want. Uh, Mark, I teach what have, not to do in Melee. <laughs> Margaret Lee, do you, have a, do you have a comment? Do you prefer tourneys or Melee? Uh, generally tourneys, although, um, Sometimes a really good melee is a great just rush of like adrenaline rush and just great for camaraderie. So I have my moments. I can't run like I used to. And so I run on a- You don't have to. So It'll still I, be as there. As I get to be an older woman, um, I'm probably the oldest of the people up speaking. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it, it makes it, I get a little frustrated. I turned 50 in a week and a half, Margie. Um, you're not that much older than me. <laughs> All right. Nick, Lena. Um, I am, yeah. Go ahead. I'm all about those melees. And especially, um, I've heard this from quite a few other women too, the whole kind of slow burn with adrenaline that we tend to have is a superpower in big melees. It's true. Oh, it's true. true. It's true. Uh... I can't, I'll be honest with you, I love them both. I just love winning a lot, <laughs> which all of you are like, we know Elidore. <laughs> 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 so I just, I love fighting, period. But like, I, it just really depends on the day, right? Like, a, right. I have to admit, my favorite days at Pensick are this. Really simple tourney in the morning lots of fighting melee in the afternoon that's really my happy like chewy moment there like that is a great pensic day for me or gulf wars day um, i can get behind that i am not a fan of farming at all right like where you have to go go get the thing and then do the thing and then do oh. how many <laughs> points right no i just want to stab people that's oh yeah just stab them i don't want to have to do math while i am fighting no math D &D town battle <laughs> uh, the woods, so, if I have to talk about a favorite melee, the fighting in the woods, I have to think, is my absolute yes. favorite melee. All right. most, most of my best war stories come from fighting melees. Like most of my favorite stories in general from the SDA are, are from melees. It, it really is a, a just a beautiful and unique time to, to, to fight. Um, still love so the there stories. I was, there I was versus the East. Anyways. Um, <laughs> I have three types of things I like. I love tournament fighting. I'm good at it. It's what I love to do. Melees, I love being the person that messes up a line. Um, I've always been the mid-round black ops team, run and gun. Um, I am the one that shaves off of lines, likes to mess up what the Tigers want to do. Um, they send 10 people after me because of my name and my rank. I love it. But I don't like fighting in the line. I like commanding a line. Because yes. the adrenaline you get when you say something and your line moves is amazing. And when you get your line to push another line without killing anybody and actually take over an area you need to take over and you barely cross swords is so much fun. That's um, one of my favorite stories is, is just what you described. All right. But, so have... but fighting on a line, eh. <laughs> All right, fair. Um, Maestro uh, Moira from, uh, from Kaid, I think, she has her hand up. Yeah, hey, guys. I've been listening, and I got here late because uh, West Coast, I was still working at the time. Um, 
uh, but I really wanted to comment on um, melees versus uh, attorneys. Um, I used to be like purely a strong melee fighter. Perf like I really loved it a lot. It took a lot longer to come to a point where I really enjoyed tournaments as much. Now I'm about equal, I would say, and I enjoy them for different reasons. But I wanted to kind of circle back to uh, some of the questions of reasons why uh, you don't see women kind of advancing in uh, prowess uh, as quickly. One of the things that I really loved about Melee is that in addition to having an, an enemy, an opponent that you're, you're you know, the enemy army that you're kind of trying to kill, it's a, it's a uh, cooperative process as well. You've got a team next to you that you're supporting. And I feel like that's something that um, a lot of women are acculturated toward that cooperation. Whereas when you get into a tournament space, it's really about you versus the other person, uh, whether you're competing with your own self uh, and you know how well you could possibly be doing or whether you're competing really in your head against the other person, uh, that is like, there's a lot less of that cooperative experience in tournament. And so that was one of the big distinctions I saw and uh, trying to assist others in moving upward in prowess and getting that comfort, comfort with tournament is I think a little bit related to that. I agree. Okay, so um, I have another question for the group. Um, to be considered for the MOT, how important are activities outside of fencing in the SCA? Uh, Master Emily, the new question we have is to be considered for the MOD, how important are activities outside of fencing in the SCA? Well, as with any period, you have to be well-rounded. So <laughs> I, I, I like to see people with a multitude of other talents. They don't have to necessarily be fantastic or the best at them. I know lots of people with lots of different interests. So to me, just a well-rounded person is, is what I'm looking for. Ooh, ooh, I got that. Okay. So I got yelled at for doing too much service. <laughs> um, I I had a tendency to be that person that wanted to fill those gaps, especially in my barony. Oh, surprise, I'm a senescial. Um But the best analogy that we have ever come with, um, my dad said it, Brigitte had it, I have it, is the bucket with a hole on the bottom. And what we see as peerages, I mean, we talked about this back when there was just scarves. Dons, Danyas, Warders, whatever you called yourself in your kingdom. And we talked about these holes in the bucket of you have a prowess bucket, you have a service bucket, you have whatever standards you're trying to match up to somebody and that you have to constantly fill with water or something because it depletes. My service bucket at the time was overflowing. I was helping at gate, I was marshalling. But my prowess bucket was kind of depleting. So it's kind of like if you're looking at a, and but as a mod, you want your prowess bucket overflowing with your service bucket kind of like level or something or your honor bucket or whatever buckets that you've created for yourself to categorize. Um, because I like well rounded people, I like people that teach. I like people that teach groups or individuals yeah. but need to be noticeable um service is a little bit important but mostly like guarding the queen like you show your your aptitude to the queen especially in on tier because we we swear to the queen out here so that that's what i look at for a mod is i i do the bucket analogy of you have all these buckets to fill focus on prowess and the fencing field but you do have other buckets you need to keep full to kind of show how well-rounded you are all right, so let's, how about this? So uh, Brigitte, I just saw your comment in there of Illidor, do we want to cut this off and host again another time? Absolutely, we're totally gonna do this again, right? Like as long as I have a Zoom account and have nowhere to go because I can't go to an event, I'm totally dragging you all online and talking with me about fencing for an hour or more. I, I will totally do that too, um, yeah. But go about what, what else, well, how about we all answer this one and then we'll wrap it up because it is getting to be a little late for some of us. I have, I have to go to work in the morning. So Dinner's we'll see on the happens. table for me. Okay, <laughs> um, all right, for you. So um, one of the things that really influenced me early on and in, in my career 
uh, was a thing called the Tournament of the Cormier. Um, and it is a magnificent uh, tournament that is hosted, uh, was started by uh, John and Inchingham in the middle. And um, there were five parts of it. You had to be able to uh, fight because, well, you know, you have to be able to defend yourself. Um, you have to be able to wear good garb and look good so that your garb is judged. For one must look good in the presence of one's patron. Um, you must be able to do bardic, for one must be entertaining to one's patron. You must uh, ha be able to do loser's chess, for you must be able to be gracious and courtly. And you must uh, speak uh, of, of, well of your opponents who should be the best courtier. Um, it was, it was silly, it was cheesy, but it was very influential to me. And it, it brought me to this place where I said, this is a really great book. Uh, and I've given it to every one of my students is the book of the courtier. And it's, for those who are unfamiliar, it is a four fictitious um, uh, discussions in the uh, court of Urbino about uh, what, what makes a good courtier and why. And I feel like our jobs as mostly Renaissance people, uh, we've, we've kind of owned that bit of the courtier. We've kind of taken on that you should look good. You should serve your crown. You should be you know, able to, to entertain and lead and you should do all of those things um, well. And so when I look at someone, I don't care if you're just a hot stick. Hot sticks, are there's a word for that. Um, a peerage, when we, when we elevate someone to the master of defense, you are a peer of society. Then we just argue about what flavor of peer you are, okay? So you are someone that can be trusted to give advice to the crown. You are someone who can be trusted to stand up for people who can't stand up for themselves. You are someone who is the shield of the weak. You are someone who is a, a teacher of all. You are someone who is able to do all of these things. Because you can fight, that's great. That's, that's why you're our order, but that doesn't make you appear if you're just a hot stick. Great. Um, who hasn't answered this one yet? A hawk. So I think the answer to that is gonna vary tremendously based on the circle, the peer, like I'll admit within my circle, I probably lean a little heavier towards the, I want you to be more than a hot stick side. And there are people within my circle who lean a little bit more towards, you know, win tournaments, hot stick, hot stick, and I guess I've seen you marshal once. Great, you're fine. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't necessarily agree with those people. Um, so it, there, there is that spectrum. I know um, uh, Mr. Rosa spoke about buckets. But we've talked about it um, almost like a D and D sheet of you, know, you get this D and D sheet. You know, here, here are your, your things, you know, hot stick, courtesy, service, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, everything needs to be at a minimum level. I, ex I have a minimum level that I expect of you of service. Like, uh, I've heard it once said that a peer is someone that I could drop in the middle of nowhere and they would be able to start a shire. And I'll admit, like, I can't ex checker to save my life, math and me. I don't like it. But I know who to ask. I've got contacts. I could find someone to ask to teach me how to do it. Same thing, you know, Seneschal. I have haven't been a, 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 a seneschal of a group before, but I know who to ask. I could figure it out. And that's kind of what my level is, is I expect you to know something of the SCA outside of just fencing. Something. Do you have to be running troll every day? God, no. Please no, because that means you're not fighting. I want you to be fighting. But you probably should have done it at least once and tried it out and been like, oh, okay, troll. Cool. I got that idea. Or something to that expect. That's, that's kind of where I go. I will totally admit, though, that the one nice thing about this uh, COVID thing is we keep having these art side events, and there's usually not a lot of fencing classes. And I'm like, oh, I can take all the other classes this time. <laughs> like, I can do that. So. Anyone else want to answer this one? All right, I can answer this one. All right. Well, too late. I'll get you in a minute. No, so, go ahead. I will be real honest with you. Um, I have, in fact, asked. Does this person dance? Can this person play chess? Do they have heraldry? If the answer to any of those is no, or they've never, they've at least, yeah, they get a no, right? At the very least, I expect you to know that SDA dancing exists, right? I don't expect you to be a good dancer. That's not in Kapora. Kapora is, you must know of dance. You at least need to know that it exists, right? Maybe no 
a pavan, which is what, it, that's the walking one, right? Isn't the pavan the one that you walk? Yes. yes. You can walk, if you can walk, you can dance, or at the very least know of it that it exists. Know of the di couple different types. I, I expected you to play chess at least once, know what the little horsey one does, right? How it moves. And Perfect. I want you to at least be able to name a couple of co colors in the heraldry, right? I want you to be a, a well-read. Right. <laughs> heraldry. Herald, that's right. Heraldry is good. Um, <laughs> great. If you could put cool badges on your stuff and then they know it's yours and then no one's going to take it by accident. Um, really, I want you to be a well-rounded SEA person, not just a hot stick. So, all right, Margaret Lee. Yeah, so yeah. Illinois, you'll be happy to know I know what a pavan is, and I actually have danced at least twice. I haven't registered my arms, but I do know her some heraldry and have actually blazoned a device. I have a wonderful herald's tourney that involves heralds and rapier fighters in the same tourney, and I'll have to tell you about it sometime. But okay. in the meantime, um, first thing, prowess brings you to the door for consideration. If you don't have a, a, a metric, you don't meet some metric bar for prowess, we're not talking about you. Yes. After that point, once you've gotten to the door, then we need to talk about, do you have some measure of service? And I don't mean just being a marshal. Right. Everybody and their brother is a marshal. You can't swing a dead cat without hitting a marshal in North Shield. So you have to do something servicey outside of, you know, just being a marshal and ideally outside of even the rapier realm. Um, same thing for arts and sciences. You have to have some um, understanding and at least have practiced some sort of art um, and participated in it um, so that you have an understanding and appreciation. You have to have a kingdom clue. That means you have to know how the kingdom runs. You have to know a little bit about what, how it functions. You have to have traveled at least once to the far side of our kingdom, which is important for us because we're a very geographically diverse, disparate kingdom. So you can't just sit in, you know, Madison and Yara and wave at the Dakotas and say, oh yes, I know what's going on there because you never will and no one will know who you are, even though you have word fame. You should have some word fame. You should display leadership. You should teach. You should know something of teaching. Mm -hmm. You should have some courtier skills. If you're a piss poor teacher and you don't know anything about how to instruct others and you only have taught like once or in your backyard, that's probably not enough. You should have a society clue. This is a society level award. You should have an understanding about how the society functions so that, and, and that's a lot to ask of, of somebody, but it's a peerage. Right. And so, and we know this. And so some people do more of each one of these things than others. This get, went back to our white scarf and said, if we put all of us together, we'd make one good white scarf. Mm. Same thing with the mods. If we put all of us together, we make one really, really good mod. Mm. But ideally we all balance each other out. Some have really a lot, you know, uber prowess and not so sciencey and artsy, but enough to get by. And so we all balance each other out. We look at our pros and cons, but ultimately we should all fill, as Rosa said, that bucket. All right, um, Emily, do you want to talk a little bit about what outside of fencing you need to do to get a peerage? I already do that. <laughs> I, do. I can't remember. All right, Rose, Nicolina, you're the last one, right? I think so. Okay. <coughs> uh, you guys covered that really well. Um, just one thing <laughs> I wanted to talk about was travel, and we touched on that just a minute ago. Um, so Artemisia is one of those really big ones. It goes from the Utah-Arizona border to the Canadian border, and um, just... Oh, that's yeah. a lot. It is a lot. I spent a lot of time in the car. And we really have a huge emphasis on travel because um, anyone who's from a very large kingdom and that has just a lot of uh, geographic and cultural and everything diversity, 
it's very easy to develop a us versus them mentality with people who are in a different part of the kingdom and have a very different background. And so if you're not getting up there, you don't understand where they're coming from. And as mods, it's our responsibility to represent the entire rapier community for our kingdom. And in order to do that, we have to know how they feel about things and have friends up there and just get it. And you can't do that without getting your butt in the car and heading up. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. I think everyone has answered this question. Yes. Rosa, did you answer this one? The only thing I would add is find friends that can help you travel. Safe, yeah. yeah. That, find that a group. Big, yeah, find a that, group. That was the big, biggest help. Biggest help I got from Brigitte when I was first financially unstable out here moving was ha having, fr having <laughs> friends that can carpool you. That is true. All right, folks. This was, I guess, episode one of uh, of Matrix <laughs> of Defense. Um, I I'm positive we're going to do this again. Um, and I think I had a really good time. Thank you all so much for participating. Thank you all for people who came and listened to us and gave us so many questions, so many good questions for us to talk about. I really appreciate all of you coming and um, I hope you all have a good evening. And uh, most importantly, I really all hope to stab you all soon. Yeah. <laughs> I would really I like to stab you, you all. I miss you Thank too. you for hosting, Yolador. Of course, anytime. Bye guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.